We've been praying and praying for Wayne and Diana, and it's always interesting to see how God answers prayers, you know, and maybe not in our timing, but uh, Wayne, we're looking forward to hearing what God's done. Well, this past Wednesday, you know, I, I told my wife, that, you know, your birthday, her birthday was Friday. I said, you know, it should be nice as a birthday present, you could, the, our visas would come in. And so, I mean, I had the tracking number because it's the envelope I had to buy and leave there. It was a priority envelope. And so I had that number. And so I, every so often, I'd, I'd get out my phone and check. Well, I hadn't traveled. And then Thursday night, we were out back to my sister's night. I'll say, hey, it's in Chicago at the postal system. And so at that point, you still really don't know what is, it is until you actually see the passports. And so anyway, we had sent it to the mission office there up in North Oak. And so about 2 o'clock, we got there, opened the envelope, and sure enough, there we had uh, three-year visas. So we're good, we're good till August of 2021. So we, we've already lost our previous tickets, so it was about two and a half weeks ago, so we're going to be probably tomorrow looking for tickets, so just appreciate your prayers for that. Um, if you just go to a, a website, and, and like united.com, say, I want to travel on a one-way ticket to South Africa, they'll quote a price of 3000 or $4,000, so we'll have to look other ways, too. And so just appreciate, um, you know, the best price, a, a, good, a good a price, with, a ticket with a good price and good route. And we'll just leave it at that. So, hey, we've enjoyed fellowshipping here at the church. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, if we're going to travel sometime in the next two weeks. That's our, that's our plan. That's all we know. And then we'll, once we'll, we'll, we can be a bit flexible on dates. So if, you know, if Tuesday is better than Saturday, we'll go Tuesday. So we really don't know uh, until we start looking. So we'll just, uh, anyway. Thanks for supporting. Thanks for praying. And it's, just, it's been great being with you. Thanks, Wayne. It's always amazing to see how God answers prayers. We just don't always appreciate sometimes the timing that he has in answering those prayers. But, you know, he is always faithful, isn't he? I'm going to turn it over to pastor at this time. We come to that part of our service today when we observe the table of the Lord. And before I have the men come forward, I'd just like to give a, a little bit of a, of a background to that. Of course, the service that we observe at this time is, is taken from the Passover. And that was an extended uh, um, dialogue along with a meal that reviewed the bondage that Israel had uh, in Egypt, their slavery the plagues, God's deliverance of them. And all of that spread out in a teaching manner for passing this on from one generation to the next. And there were four, actually four cups of wine that were served during the meal. And they each had a purpose and a name to them. The first was the cup of sanctification and reminds us that every one of us need to be separated from sin. For Egypt is a picture of our unsaved life. And so the first and most important thing is that we observe is our being set apart from sin. The second was the cup of judgment. And in that one, they reviewed the plagues that were upon Egypt that finally prompted the Pharaoh to allow them to go. The third one, redemption, as they finally were able to leave. Of course, all of these find their true significance within Jesus Christ. And the fourth cup was the cup of the kingdom or the cup of praise. It's interesting to me, it was after that first cup, the cup of sanctification, that Jesus would have taken the matzah bread and broken it. And they would have expected him to say, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who makes, who gives to us the fruit of the earth. But instead, he surprised them, and for the first time ever, the words were uttered, This is my body, 
which is broken for you. When they came to the end of the Passover observance, they would have had the cup of praise, or some call it the cup of the kingdom. It was at that point, I believe, that Jesus, again, instead of saying, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who makes the fruit of the vine, or who gives to us the fruit of the vine, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you give testimony to my death until I come back. Those words never uttered before, but now gives new significance to the matzah cracker and to the cup of wine. I'm going to ask the men to come forward who will be serving the Lord's table. After the first cup of wine, Jesus, as the one leading the Seder service, would have taken a piece of cloth, and inside the cloth he would open it up, and there were three matzah crackers, a few inches, maybe like three inches um, square. And he would take the center one out, and he would break it and uttered the words, Blessed are thou, O God, King of the universe. But on this time, as he broke it, he said, This is my body. It's broken for you. In those few words he was saying, I'm going to die in your place. I'm going to pay the penalty for you. I will be broken on your behalf. Let's thank him. You are not only the king of the universe and the giver of all good and perfect gifts, but the giver of the most blessed gift, our salvation. We thank you, our Father, for your great plan and for your son's willingness to be broken on our behalf. As we partake of this, we are reminding ourselves that there was a day when we received Jesus as our personal Savior. And this is a symbolic act reminding ourselves our hope is found in the broken body of Jesus. We bless you, our Savior. Amen. Let's partake. We aren't sure just when Jesus introduced the words, this is my blood. This is a new covenant established in my blood. It could have been after the third or the fourth cups, either redemption or praise. I kind of think it was after the last one, or at the last one, for Jesus said, I want you to all drink it, I will not drink it, until I come into my kingdom. And he passed it around and had them drink it. He was talking about a new covenant that had been promised back in Jeremiah 31, a covenant that God was making with Israel where he would change the hearts of people literally do a transformation, a miracle where he transforms hearts that had been astray and now were coming back to him. He was establishing a relationship based on a change that he actually makes within us. It is the hope of every believer that one of these days I'm going to leave this body of sin and I will be in the presence of my Savior, and never, ever again will I sin. Are you glad for that? And God established that covenant. We are the beneficiaries, though not the recipients of that covenant. And today we celebrate, we are included, as those 
who receive a new nature that will live forever. Let's thank him. We're grateful, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, whose blood established forever a permanent relationship between you and the believer. And today we acknowledge that because of that established covenant, we look forward to an eternity of being with you. And we know that we've already received that new nature. We've already been born again and are thankful to you. As we take this cup, it is with thanksgiving for the redemption we have received. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to see your strength, Pastor, today. And so very thankful for your return to some of the duties. And we look forward to that strength returning full force so that we can enjoy the continued fullness of that ministry and your teaching as well. Until that time, you're stuck with me this morning anyway. And um, this morning it's about taking today as an opportunity to do several things relative to what we have just done, and that is to memorialize the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. One of the passages I use often when I approach the Lord's table is 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 29 where Paul wrote that I received from the Lord what also I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whenever or whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. No one takes the Lord's table more seriously than the Lord himself. And he wants us to approach it with solemnity, with soberness, and with reflection, remembering that it's his death that indicates how much he hates sin and how much it works against us who would want to serve him, who would want to be with him eventually, and to drink it without having a time of examination would be a tremendous disservice to the Lord's intent and what he seeks to teach us or one of the things that he seeks to teach us by remembering his death. And so there are several things that are an opportunity for us whenever we meet around the Lord's table that I would like to share with you this morning. And the first one is this, and that is, this is an opportunity to remember that he died for us. He died for us. In Romans 6, verses uh, 5, verses 6 through 8, we read that, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to clean up first. The cleaning up comes after. And the act of cleaning up 
It's based upon the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't wash ourselves in anything that would clean us of our sin. I don't know, some stains are very hard to get out, aren't they? I have a, well, my, a, a friend that was in the Navy once had these dress whites. And every once in a while, I guess he would be eating someplace in those dress whites and get a stain on it. And um, I remember once asking about, how do you get those stains out? You can't be buying new whites all the time. And he shared this little uh, tidbit. And, um, but it requires that you be willing to give up your shirt for about a week. And you put it in this, I have this metal bowl that I'll take a shirt that I've got something on stick it in this big metal bowl with some water and some Dawn dish liquid, a significant amount of that. And I let it soak for a week. Well, that's, I know it seems like, I've tried to do it for less than a week and sometimes the results are not as great. But leave it in there for a week and it takes just about anything out, especially things that are oil-based like I discovered pizza sausage, you know, <laughs> drops on your shirt and LOC didn't do it and that's supposed to do everything. There's some stains that are hard to get out, but whenever I pull the shirt out and get ready to throw it into the wash and when it comes out, it's, it's gone. But I have to be willing to give up the shirt for about a week. Jesus' blood cleanses the stain of sin in my life forever. And, and that's a miracle. Blood is a hard stain to, to get out. But Jesus uses the blood to cleanse me of my sin. And it was his own blood, not mine. It didn't require my blood. I could have offered it. I could have offered to die for my, my own sins. And a lot of people do. The thing of it is, it doesn't pay for anything. Jesus' blood pays for everything. Jesus paid it all, as far as my sin debt is concerned. He demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, really, Christ died for us. But it had to be so. Had to be just this way for a number of reasons. The first one is that we were powerless to redeem ourselves by our own deaths. But it wouldn't have bought us eternity. We would have, we would have just been paying the, we would have just been receiving the consequence of our sin, but not paying for our sin. Jesus is the only one who could do that. It had to be so also, because we were without the perfect righteousness required to pay our sin debt. We were sinners. We were ungodly. Now, I don't know if you, <laughs> you may not consider yourself to be very much of a sinner or very ungodly. I remember Sharon told me the story when she was working as a, that was my, my first wife, Sharon, told me the story when she was working at a, a malt shop in Mequon, Wisconsin, just north of Milwaukee. And she tried to witness to one of the ladies that was there and in you know, inform her that, you know, we need Christ because we're sinners. And this lady said, I don't sin. And Sharon said, you mean you've never lied? And she said, no, I've never lied. She said, well, that's your first one. <laughs> and I don't know, I can't remember what happened after that, but, but she, was, she was like that, not, not in a, a mean way at all, but she just liked to make points uh, in, in that way. We, we were sinners. We were ungodly. And thankfully, we have a way out because we don't stop being sinners once we accept Christ. We still are sinners. It's just that they're all paid for. But the way we deal with the sin afterwards is that we seek cleansing on a constant basis by confessing our sins. And then he is faithful, he's just, to forgive us our sins. 
every kind of sin. We don't, we don't say that to give you encouragement to do all the sinning you can. There are other passages that say, no, that's not, that's not God's intent. Uh, so remember, we were without the perfect righteousness required to pay our sin debt. And then thirdly, we needed someone who loved us enough to take our place of judgment. Loved us enough. Christ, the perfect substitute. So, the Lord's table is the perfect place to remember that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's another opportunity for us as we remember the Lord's death. And that is an opportunity to remember that he died only once. He died only once and that his death was sufficient. That one death was sufficient. He didn't have to keep on doing it as the Old Testament priests uh, used to have to keep on performing sacrifices on a constant basis. Jesus only had to do it once. Now, I want you to know that the Lord's table is in no way a new sacrifice of Christ's body and blood whenever it isn't observed. It was still only done once. We just remember it as oft as we can. We remember it because God has said it's a good thing for us to remember the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf for our sins. In the Old Testament, we're told that day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, meaning Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. There is no need to repeat Christ's sacrifice. Although we know of, of a few denominations that would say, no, nah, he needs to repeat that. And we do that in the form of the observance of the Lord's table where Christ, the bread becomes Christ's body and the, and the blood becomes, or the, the cup becomes his blood. Not so, not so. These are meant to be helpful in causing us to remember the tremendous sacrifice and debt that was paid on our behalf when Jesus hung on the tree. There is no need to repeat Christ's sacrifice. Let me remind you of several things that, uh, that, that uh, come out from Scripture relative to this idea. From 1 John, we learn that his sacrifice is sufficient to cover all sinners. All sinners. John wrote, my dear children, I write to this, write this to you so that you will not sin. Now here's a reminder that though we're still going to sin. We're still sinners. But if anybody does sin, well, Christ is going to have to come back. And we're going to have to put a cross up on a hill and we're going to have to sacrifice them all over again. No, nope, don't have to. No, nope, it's already been done. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's just how... Uh, broad, how sufficient the death of Jesus Christ was. It covers all sinners. Forget about the concept of limited atonement in that sense. Because the blood of Jesus Christ is not limited to just how many may or will. It covers everybody's sin. It's that great. The, the deciding factor is whether you accept that as payment for your sin. The account is there if you're willing to draw from it. 
But you can choose not to. And sad to say, many do. His sacrifice is sufficient to cover all sins, uh, or all sinners. But his sacrifice also is sufficient to cover all sins. Covers all sinners, it covers all sins. As we mentioned in 1 John uh, 1, 8, 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. No real sinless perfection on this side of heaven. No perfect perfection of sanctification this side of heaven. We are always in the process of becoming sanctified and more like Christ. Though in standing, we are in the eyes of Christ sanctified so that when we die, we are able to go immediately to his presence. But positionally sanctified, but not practically sanctified. So, we must confess our sins. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from every sort. The Greek uh, intends us to, to feel about this. From every kind of sin or unrighteousness. There's not a sin that's not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's how magnificent it is in its ability to cover all sins. Now I'll understand this as well. His sacrifice is sufficient to cover all sinners and all sins for all time. It's not just a limited offer. It's for all time. Once you get it, there's no expiration date on the payment for your sins. The only expiration date concerning any of this is should you expire before making a decision. That's the only expiration date. If you do not have the blood applied to you by the time that you die, that's the expiration date. But once you become a Christian, there's no expiration date on your coverage. By his own blood, he obtained our redemption. Hebrews 9.12 says, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. No falling away from grace. No falling away. One of the main ministries of Jesus Christ is to be that forever high priest who is eternally standing before the Father as our advocate, shielding us from any accusation that Satan might try to, to pose uh, to say that we are unworthy. We are unworthy, but Christ is all worthy. He paid the debt. I could not pay with a death or, or with a, 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 for something that he did not owe, a debt he did not owe. So remember that. His sacrifice is sufficient for all sinners. It's sufficient for all sins. And it's sufficient for all time. Take comfort in that. That's just how marvelous and magnificent the fullness of Christ's sacrifice is. And then thirdly, there's an opportunity here to remember that he died for our benefit. His death was selfless. His death was selfless. We're told that he could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him from that dark hour. And he did ask that the cup might pass from him if it were possible. But he willingly submitted when the father said, this is the only way. This is the only way we get anybody to experience this wonderful salvation that can only come by your shed blood. And then Jesus became obedient even unto death. 
the death of a cross for our sins. His death was selfless. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And notice this, because what follows are the very things that Jesus' blood covers. He who forgives all our sins, heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Forget not all his benefits that are tied directly to the shedding of his blood, the breaking of his body on our behalf. Philippians 2.8 reminds us that he was found in appearance as a man, and in doing that, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And we receive the benefit of that. His death was selfless. And by selflessly humbling himself, even to the point of dying for all of us, here it comes. Seven things I I found in scripture that are benefits to us. Because Christ selflessly gave himself for us. First of all, he was willing to become a servant that we might become servants. Do you remember Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7 says that in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, uh, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. As far as Christians are concerned, there are none who are too good to serve another. In fact, the very definition of a leader from a Christian standpoint is to be a servant. Jesus himself said that any of you who would be a a, a master will be a servant. I remember I went, uh, I flew down to Fort, uh, to, uh, Fort Worth for uh, administrators training, Christian administrators training, and one of, the, one of the definitions of a leader or qualities of a leader was that they were ones who sought not to have their own will done, but to fulfill the, uh, the best hopes that their staff had um, to make their jobs easier and more productive. You're not bosses with whips. You're servants seeking to help others to do their jobs better. And he gave the, the instructor gave this illustration. He says, in the world, you have this picture of people trying to climb the ladder and from the world's perspective, if, if you're on top or moving up on the ladder and there's someone below you, they're going to be stomping on your hands, hoping that you'll lose and fall. And then if there's anybody above you, you'll be pulling at their ankles to pull them down so that you can advance. They said from the Christian's perspective on this ladder... Your job is really to keep pushing the ones ahead of you up and reaching down and bringing the ones below you up to your level. And that way, everybody benefits. Otherwise, it's just selfishness that promotes only uh, discord and distrust, and everybody's watching their back. Jesus became a servant so that we might become servants. He became poor, 
that we might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. I don't know what Jesus' home looked like in heaven, but I know it's got to be better than anything I've ever seen down here. And I know that when he had the opportunity, he was ready to go back to be with his father. That was his hope, to one day return. And in the upper room, he, had, he wanted to, to, to bring his disciples with him someday so they could see where he lived. I want you to come to my house. I want to share with you what's there for you. No matter how good you may have thought you had it here, you ain't seen, well, I don't know how perfect the Lord's grammar was all the time. I don't know whether it's a sin to have bad grammar or not. But sometimes it makes a point. You ain't seen nothing yet, maybe. And I can't wait to show it to you. But he was willing to leave all of that Come down here to where we live. We would call it slumming nowadays. So that he could give us an invitation and a a hunger for being with him someday in his home. And this passage calls that grace. That was the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that made him willing to do that. Wonderful grace. Grace. Matchless grace for your sake. He became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. And then he became our sin bearer so that we might become sin free. I taught taught a high school Christian living course for a period of time in, in one of the Christian schools. And I wanted to make the point sometime about just how much we may sin and not even have any idea about the heaviness of that. And I said this in front of the class, okay, I I know you guys. I mean, we've been together here for a few years. And some of you have been in my office several times for various reasons. And we've had discussions. We know that there are things to celebrate, but sometimes we've had to do other things. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you, knowing that I know you, you know me too, but I know you, how many many times do you think you sin in a day? And they said, well, they were reluctant. I said, well, would you say that understanding that there are sins of omission, things that you should have done but you didn't do, things of commission where you intended to do it uh, and just didn't get caught? But how many times a day do you think you sin? Would, would, would you at least own up to maybe one sin a day? Yeah, we'll own up to one sin a day. And I said, that's not very much, is it? It seems to be a big deal. Uh, Somebody's making a big deal out of a whole lot of nothing when they get upset with you for just sinning maybe once a day. And then I said, what's, what's the average lifespan of an individual? The scriptures say what? They said 70 years by reason of strength, you know, 80. I said, let's just go with 70 How many of you have got your calculators out now? (laughs) No? Good. So I said, let's calculate one sin a day, 365 days a year for 70 years. Can't be a very big amount, can it? 25,550. I said, that sounds like a heavy load to me. And I know that they're to varying degrees of, of seriousness in your mind, but 
you know, sin is sin. For just to know what to do that is good and not to do it, that's sin. And just to think some things, that in itself is sin. I wonder how many of us could go with the just one sin a day count. Maybe two or three and think how exponentially that rises. And Jesus is willing to cover all of that by his own blood in one moment of time, if you haven't done it, by trusting him as Christ, as, as, as your Savior, Christ your Savior. That's a lot of offenses to forgive of any one of you. And I said, I know some of you are still holding grudges from things a couple of years back. But Jesus has covered it all. He became our sin bearer so that we might become sin free. 1 Peter 2.24 says he himself bore our sins and his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. A sin bearer. (laughs) And have we thought much about what the weight of that sin. I don't know how many billions of people have come to Christ. Each with their own 25,550 sins. And Jesus bore all of them on the cross. All of them. And then... We could say as well that he became our substitute on Calvary so that we might not have to bear the eternal consequences of our own sin. Ephesians 53 verse 4 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by, by him and afflicted. This person on the cross doesn't look like somebody who's... who's uh, considered to be very well esteemed in God's eyes. Otherwise, he wouldn't be on this cross. What they didn't understand, that Jesus wasn't, wasn't dying for his own sin. He was dying for, for theirs, yours and mine. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you know what that placard was on the cross that Jesus died on? Do you know know what it said? Jesus Christ, Jesus, King of the Jews, Son of God. That was not meant to identify who Jesus was. Those were the charges that were leveled against him for what the Jews considered to be blasphemy. That was Jesus' list of sins, so to speak. That's what he died for as far as Pilate was concerned. But I would suggest to you that that list could have been a whole lot longer because of what Colossians 2 says. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us. Now, he didn't forget about them. He just canceled them as far as our responsibility for them was. But he took those sins and put them on his son. He has taken it away and nailed them to the cross. There's no way. Can you imagine the length of the of the papyrus? <laughs> The roll of that scroll, what it would have had to have been to cover the sins of the world listed that Jesus bore. And yet all of them in God's heart and mind were nailed to that cross. 
the charges against us were placed upon him. He died for them. He also became our redeemer so that he could pay the debt we could not pay. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. You know, God is not going to accept your gold from your safe, all the coins that you've been, and the silver that you've been buying as a result of the ads on TV, because the price is going to be going up real soon. And he won't take a check, ATM, or anything else. No, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That was the price. You're not a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus was the only one. He's the only one qualified to pay that debt. And he has paid it on your behalf. And by faith, you receive the benefit of that. He became our rescuer so that we could be freed from death and Hades. John writes, when he first sees uh, Jesus... In the book of the Revelation, in his vision, he says, I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now what? I am alive forever and ever. You know what else? I hold the keys of death and Hades. I don't know who you thought held the keys before, but I've got them now. When you die, I can unlock that door. And you'll come out. And you know what I'm like. You know how much I love you. You think I'm going to allow you to stay in a stinking grave? Because I've already told you I want you to be with me, John. I'm going to rescue you from this mess because I hold the keys of death and Hades. I'm the only one who does. Not the devil. Not any other human being. No, no angel. I have them right here. And what is so tremendous about all of this is this final benefit. And that is he became our eternal high priest. Jesus is the only one who can make a promise and make sure that it stays promised. (laughs) Because he lives forever to keep his promises. Hebrews 7 24 says, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. He's a a permanent representative between yourself and God. Therefore, those of you who are wondering whether God's going to get the done work and your uh, work done in your lifetime, whether, whether the process is going to be completed or not, Jesus is there to make sure it's completed. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. I think Pastor at some point is going to share a story and I won't steal any thunder, but it was precious to hear it from him that will prove the point that he's always there looking out for you even when you don't know it, he knows your needs before you know or re- realize you have them, and he's beginning, he makes provision for them. That's how much he cares. He, he's, he's not waiting for you 
to realize anything at all. He knows what his plans are for you. They're meant for good and not for evil. He's going to save you completely. He's not going to let anything interrupt his plan for you. His eyes are on you all of the time. He's watching you. Even when you're not even aware of it, he's meeting needs. And I look forward to you hearing some of that because the pastor has some tremendous things to tell us when he has the time to do it, and I can't, can't wait for it. So, this is how we want to leave thinking about all of this. Greater love has no one than this. That he laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that. We also know he laid down his life for his enemies. (laughs) But all we can do in response to that is praise him and say, hallelujah. What a savior. What a savior. And what an opportunity we had today to remember all of that about him together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I don't know that there might not be, or that there, that there might not, might be someone here who is really something, realizing some things about their relationship with you that is, that is short of faith in, in your Son. And having seen what Christ came to do, what his death indicates of his love for us, our need for him, and what is at stake concerning our salvation. But if there's anyone here who does not have that full uh, realization, who cannot remember a time when when they prayed that you would take the burden of your sin away from them, upon your son that they do that today because day, now is the day of salvation and there are a number of people who are waiting to do that I can stand in front and wait pastor can stand in front and wait we have deacons here that, that know the way there are others that you might know with whom you have confidence, but do not leave this place without knowing that Jesus Christ died for your sins and lives eternally to see that salvation completed and you in heaven with him. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.